There was so much pain. She never quite felt anything like this. She couldn't open her eyes. There was just unbearable pain and the vague feeling that her body was being moved around. A little murmur of words touched her ears, but felt like cold iron blades scraping against her skull. The little earth pony finally managed to open her eyes, but despite the glasses still perched upon her nose, she could only see a blurry mess. But as things began to shape up, the dark blurry vision was a more brighter blurry vision, and while she could basically only groan and whimper in pain, she was confident that Kroos and Oso were with her. <laughs> At least she's alive. Kroos's voice sounded a little dull and distant to her, but despite the pain, she was overjoyed to hear it. She reached up to try and embrace her own head, but massive talons pushed her hooves back down. No, stop that. Just drink. She barely noticed something being pressed to her lips. All she was saw was a blurry purple. Her mind concluded that it was a healing potion. She tried to ask what happened, but all that came out was a long, painful whimper. Thankfully, Oso either understood or gave the answer coincidentally. Stay still. You've been shot. But seriously, though, can we go back to the wolves? I'm one of those talismans. Kroos chuckled, flipping something about in his talons. Sipping the purple potion as fast as she could, slowly she began to feel a bit better. But she could clearly tell just by opening her mouth and closing it that her head was quite swollen. But the confusion was still there. Her face and head hurt like nothing she had ever felt, and she was swollen. Yeah, well, it's a good thing I got her the iron token. Otherwise, she would be extremely, unbelievably, gone right now. Oso swiped the object Kroos was playing with. I'm still quite surprised that it broke. I mean, hell, those things are crazy effective. The hell did that raider shoot her with? Blurry Kroos picked up a weapon off the ground. Eight-gauge tungsten shell. Kroos whistled happily as he pulled a small bag open with the gun and slung it over his shoulder. And it's an auto shoddy. Shit condition, but she's a pretty girl. She could hear the cackling and clicking as he filled with it. Tungsten. Well, I guess that explains the damage. I'm surprised she's still alive. Kroos pushed the potion to her lips again and she sipped painfully. Well, it's not just the material of the slug. You gotta take into account the type of the propellant and the amount, then the make of the gun, the length, and even the weight of the barrel. All sorts of stuff. Surprised you don't know this. How old are you? Kroos poked at the much larger bird and only earned a loud sigh. I do not like using guns. I will if I have to, or if it's super convenient, but I prefer to use melee weapons. I got a lot of mass, and I prefer to use it more than fluttering away and being just a flesh tank lugging around some 40 millimeter cannon. He squinted at Kroos, who leaned in waiting for the answer to his other question. And I'm none of your damned business years old. There was a loud pop, which shot an old cold shock down Lexi's spine. Her vision swam even more, but the pain started to die down. Oso looked over at his rather stoic features, betrayed a touch of relief. Aye. Up, little one. I'm going to be carrying you for a while. She started to protest until the very moment she started to really move. Instantly, she doubled over as the pain shot her back like fire, and she vomited. Stop thrashing! Your skull just barely knit back together! She could feel Oso's talons under her midsection as he lifted her. The pain was extreme, but with the sudden soft prick of numbness shot through her, she became even more dazed. She noticed Oso's voice, but couldn't make out what he was saying, just that it was angry, and she felt she barely placed Kroos's retort. There was some back and forth before everything faded so much that she couldn't tell what was going on. Everything was one massive blur. 
The last touch of sensation was her body coming to a rest before things began to get dark. Lexicon sputtered awake, head aching like no other, and her body felt numb and tingly. She moved just a little before she felt something very uncomfortable. She pushed the blankets she was tucked away with to find a catheter had been placed into her. She was a little shocked and a bit more embarrassed, but she took quick stock of her situation. Her forehead was heavily bandaged. Her vision was back, but her glasses were stuck to her snout with blood. She still hurt horribly, and she started to panic a little. But a set of talons landed on her shoulder, and she looked up to Kroos. Eh, what, what happened? He grimaced a little and cleared his throat. You were shot in the head? Damn. Right between the eyes. But I think you're all right. She blinked, recalling Oso's blurry voice spouting off. But she turned and looked him in the eyes. How? He blinked and ducked his head slightly, looking back behind him. Well, you remember those things we got from the wolves? They're some sort of talisman. One that keeps you warm, the other apparently makes your flesh as durable as iron. So instead of killing you instantly, the tungsten slug just cracked your skull and broke the talisman. He fidgeted a little and raised a talon. But you were in so much pain that I shot you full of medics. Elsa yelled at me because apparently there's something about not pumping someone full of drugs when they have a severe head injury. But I just didn't want you thrashing about when we were trying to carry you. She recalled something about such precautions, but she had to be honest, she was just happy to be alive. Then she remembered the horrible hell she was in, and while her opinion did not pull back, she did rethink her thankfulness. Wait, what about the raider who shot me? She vaguely recalled pulling the trigger, but she didn't know what happened. Focusing, she remembered Kroos talking about the shotgun used against her. A sudden pang of guilt shot through her. She wasn't certain, but her near-vacant glare dropped, and she questioned it. Did she actually kill another pony? She bit her lips as the thoughts ran through her. It really was him or her, but in this case she guessed it was both. But it gnawed at her insides. She'd killed some ponies. Oh, I shot him. Crow spoke in his usual carefree, nonchalant tone. She jerked her head towards Crow's hard enough at the pain to shoot through her head again. Holding her head, she looked at him, glancing at her like she was stupid. Relief ticked through her, and she sighed. But something else still nodded her. She shook it off and looked up, blushing uncomfortably. And, and, the catheter. He rose to his talons and backed up. Nope, that was Oso. You can't pay me enough to touch your coochie. She huffed at the words and struggled to fight back the blush again, remembering how eager he was back under the snow. She shook it off and winced with the pain once more. Um, so, what now? She did not want to try and fall back asleep after sleeping for who knew how long. So she looked at Kroos, who calmly walked away, looking back only as he got to some trees. Get some rest. The sun's up in about an hour or two. She watched him walking into the shadows, and she felt a touch of loneliness. She felt safe, at least. But she was extremely stressed. She grumbled and pulled her blankets as she poked about her bags. Mumbling under her breath, she flinched as she fidgeted to tie out the catheter. She blushed as she focused a bit and pulled it free. The image of Oso putting it in sent a flush of heat into her, and she buried herself into the blankets. The fluttering and pulled out one of her books and pushed it through enough to read through the pages quickly. But as she flipped pages, she couldn't tell if it was disinterest or her flutter that she felt impatient. It was as if her reading was getting in the way of something. It was more than a little frustrating, but soon she simply pushed the book back into her bags and reached for another. But she couldn't bring herself to pull another out. 
Flustering and gritting her teeth, she near frantically looked left and right before ducking back under the covers. Butting her lips, she reached low and took a deep breath, imagining Kroos back under the snow. She flinched as her heart raced, imagining the possibilities. What if Oso hasn't interrupted? What if Kroos didn't turn her down? She had felt him literally milliseconds away from actually doing the deed. The rush, the excitement, it made her shiver just thinking about it. Her hoof slowed as her memories of his rejection flooded in and started to taunt her. She swapped out Kroos for Wax Seal, imagining him for some odd reason getting involved with her back in the stable. But the moment she tried to put some plot to her fantasy, she remembered his death, and even more flustered, she dredged up the thoughts of other stallions before she thought of Oso. The acknowledgement that he had put the catheter in was just barely enough. In order to do that, he would have had gotten pretty familiar with her business downstairs. She knew the feeling of his impossibly strong talons picking her up like she was a kitten. She imagined those same talons gripping her hips. She winched at the thought of some pony that size having his way with her, but somehow she shivered in pleasure. Sure, it would be difficult and probably painful, but something about an act that required so much force made her excited. She winced, playing on the fantasy, weaving them into her mind, picturing herself with a pretty collar being herded about on command. She could almost hear Oso's deep voice rumbling, telling her to present to him. A slightly more intense urge shot into her, and she pictured him uh, making her beg, walking her on a leash, even showing her off, and the things that nearly made her squeak just passing through her mind. She was so close. Her teeth nibbled into one lip as she just barely drew blood. Her mind, a flurry, she imagined him more and more. Anything she could add to the fantasy, ordering her to be a good girl. The rush, such dirty, nearly taboo thoughts rolling about in her. She was teetering on the edge and bit down hard, imagining the wolves who had caught her. She could almost hear their voices, imagining their scrawny creatures pinning her down, and... The thought died where she sat. She had to stop. The pleasure and desire for such pleasure was very strong, but the last thought was almost too much. Self-loathing Lexi screamed at her in the air as... Shame bubbled about, drowning out even horny Lexi. A touch of that self-disgust hit her like a sky bus, and she buried her face into the blankets, hating herself. That? That's what I... Uh. She mentally beat herself up as two dozen Lexis argued and retched within her. Her mind screamed, demanding why she would want that in her mind, even at the apex of her fantasy. She paused and slapped the label of shameful private time onto that section of her memories. Logical Lexi shouted at her that it was just a reaction. She had just had yesterday come so close to something she never had. It was a natural to explore a fantasy and scenarios. Another Lexi told her that she should be ashamed. Other Lexis clobbered her for that, even as others offered anything from excuses to criticisms to theories. But she ached and fought the guilty mentality. But it wasn't very long before she found herself reaching beneath the covers again, despite the gaggle of angry Lexis. She forced herself to stop, her mind on fire with all the issues at hoof. But even if she needed to sleep, there was no way she could have at the moment. But then it hurt her, all the flustering and grumbling. She was likely at the beginning of a heat. Without questioning it, she latched on to the explanation and dumped the blame onto the chemistry cycle. She remembered her first heat. She was clever, but her mother was always on top of things. She got the talk the first time, but it was her mother's talk. After her dad, whom she had still never met, her mother was inexplicably misandrous. She remembered about little other ponies she may have been able to call friends. Many of them spoke of their heat troubles. They always talked about having phallic toys or objects or even had cold friends. But, like always, she was a bit behind the curb. She once saved up and purchased something for herself when she was younger, but her mother thoroughly objected to, uh, with an extreme livid persecution that everything phallic-shaped was bad. Prior to the world ending, her sole relief from heats were her romance novels. She blushed, 
and pushed the blankets into her face and groaned loudly. But she shot upright like lightning when something cluttered just a little ways off. She viciously seized the opportunity to escape her own thoughts and whipped about to see Oso starting to pack up. Noticing her, the giant griffin set aside his current task and slowly began making his way over, but he hesitated, looking down at her, making sure she was more comfortable. She couldn't help but cringe at the idea of him possibly knowing her fantasies just minutes ago. But, to her relief, his words were a very welcome distraction. You're okay. She nodded quickly and started to stand up, but looked about for the trousers. It wasn't exactly so cold that she needed to wear them, but she wanted something to cover up her rump, at least. Y yeah I woke up a little bit ago. Crows told me what happened. I'm... I'm feeling a lot better. He nodded with a half-satisfied, half-relieved look about him. Aye. So long as you're up and about, you can get your stuff packed up. We've got a little ways to go. She looked up at him, and questions bubbled. But the desire to hide, at least for the moment, made her remain quiet. She didn't really know where they were going, but she figured it was a long way. She bumbled about, sliding on what clothes she had, and pushed items into her bags when she flinched. She noticed Oso was looming over her. Turning about, she blinked at the large griffin. The look on his face told her that she, he wanted to speak with her about something that he was hesitant to request. Her mind instantly fell back to her fantasies, and a mixture of hope and horror shot through her. But the Lexies within all went silent as his features showed a touch of worry and sorrow. There is something. I really shouldn't give you the option. We've been trying to get our project running for a long time, and, well, my original offer has to change. You helped us a lot, but I won't force you to help us with this project, so I'm going to offer you this one chance. He looked over at her, and a great deal of uncertainty washed over him. Wh what Part of her beamed with curiosity and hope that he would tell her more, but the rest of her noticed something was a tad wrong. You can leave now if you want to. With Kroos. I won't stop you if you decide to go. His eyes were distant and pained, but Lexi gave her best. I have no clue what the hell you're talking about, face, and Oso shook his head. Originally, the offer was that if you helped us, I'd let you hang out around our base. You could come in for food and safety. You would ideally spend the rest of your life there. But... The Susie's conditions for their assistance changes everything. Look, I will be overjoyed if you stay. If you do, you will be going with us, everywhere we go. I don't think Tyron will put you in danger intentionally, unless you anger him. But if he knows you are the only reason that the Susie's helped us, he will not let you go. She shivered and logical Lexi looked to caution Lexi, who both hummed and grumbled as they passed whispers to each other. But both flinched along with Lexicon herself as Oso's talons caressed her chin and pulled her to look into his eyes. If you try to leave after this, Tyron is likely to kill you. Make your choice. If you leave, I'll tell him the truth. You were shot in the head on your way back. He yanked the bandage off, prompting Lexi into a soft yelp. She couldn't see the injury, but she was certain from the hefty scab and still horrendously aching skull that it was going to be a rather impressive scar. But scars aside, the whole idea terrified her all over again. She never wanted to hear gunfire again, but even with Kroos at her side for a year, she had seen just a touch of what the wasteland held. Even Kroos couldn't defend her fully, but she couldn't be asked to be on the battlefield again. She was wrenched out of her thoughts as Oso turned about and started to pack up again. A touch of panic teased at the edge of her mind. She had no idea what to do. This god's awful land would take her to the drop of a hat. But what was she to do? Her mind buzzed and logical Lexi practically frothed at the mouth trying to make a choice. She remembered very clearly how little Tyron cared of the lives of those around him quite literally referring to her as a thing that he would kill, or simply for convenience. She shuddered at the thought of having to spend another time near the old griffin. 
but she blinked as she felt Lausica Lexi tugging at her attention and pointing at part of her mind that she was neglecting. Oh. What the hell am I going to do if I don't go with them? She grumbled and shoveled the rest of her gear into her bags. Sure, she could probably make it a, for the first year with Crows helping her out. But after he left, and she knew he would leave, as much as she fantasized about the Griffin sticking around for her, the more she got to know him, the far, far less it seemed that he would do anything close to that. There was so much in the air, but if she was the only thing keeping their project going, then maybe someone as mean as Tyron would be willing to help keep her safe and not hurt her? Clamping her eyes shut, she hissed through her teeth, grinding the options against her mind, but she wasn't fooling herself. Even the Lexies inside were already getting ready. She looked up over at her bags and slung it over her back and struggled up to Oso. I'm coming with you. He looked up to her, almost with a touch of sorrow, but he nodded and slid the last of gear into his packs as he made eye contact. I can't be there to protect you all the time, and Kroos will likely get a little roughed up once or twice, but I'll do everything I can to keep you safe. Then came something that surprised her a bit. His talons rested firmly on the top of her head. A simple pat, but when he turned away, a flurry of emotions washed over her, ranging from embarrassed to downright naughty as the Majority of the Lexies went hunting for horny Lexi to tie her up and beat her senseless and throw her into a closet. But alas, her heat gave horny Lexi special logic-defying powers. Unable to find horny Lexi and wreak bloody vengeance upon her, logical Lexi dropped the shell to try and snuff it out entirely. He sees you as a kid. He's patting your head because he's literally your full sitter. You make some weird faces, little one. Oh, so chuckled and turned about. Almost instantly, Lexicon snapped to and grumbled. Together, they started to walk as she started to wonder where Kroos had gone off to. But in mere seconds, he seemed to pop up at her side and walk over to them. Why aren't we flying? Kroos's tone was firm and pointed at Oso, who simply glanced back lazily. I'm a pretty big target. And, performed the perforated eardrums, are better taken in shifts. Oso jutted a thumb at Lexi, who struggled for a moment to think before she took offense. She was still plenty blurry and wobbly from her head injury. Ah, come on. Just gag her and tie her up. Hell, I'll help. Kroos poked into his bags, and without even thinking about it, a thick blush covered Lexi's cheeks. She caught herself and forcefully thought of literally anything else. Tell you what, there's an enclave station a few miles ahead. You fly in and out to show me it's safe, and we'll fly. I'll even carry Lexi. He reached over and scooped her up. Ah, put me down. She squirmed and also glanced at her curiously before his eyes widened ever so slightly, and he set her down. That one vague sign shot blush all over her as logical Lexi screamed, He noticed. She scooted back and did her best not to look him in the eye, but Kroos's grumbling saved the day. That would be suicide, you dipshit! Also looked away from Lexi and nodded. Exactly, and that is why I'm not flying up there. I might be pretty fast, but I'm still 900 pounds of bird. And if you didn't know, you're quite trigger-happy with their little cannons. Also stepped towards, uh, between Kroos and Lexicon. Lexi quickly attempted to compose herself as the two griffins chattered. Well, we can fly low. Kroos did a quick loop-to-loop, -loop, weaving in and out of the dead tree branches. Yes, there's a problem with that too, little one. Oso snapped his wings open to their fullest span, and actually knocked over one of the nearby trees. I might be sneaky when I need to be, but at high speeds I really don't do obstacles. You have a fucking excuse for everything! 
Kroos' words began to fill with anger as he glared the giant Oso down. No, I have a plan for everything. A plan based in reality and experience. Exactly how do you think someone my size has survived all of this time? He stepped closer, quite literally looming over him to the point where he nearly had to look down directly to make eye contact. In fucking Dr. Frankenpony's lab, you giant fucking turkey! Kroos looked about ready to start swinging, and while Oso didn't look angry or concerned, he did look like he was ready to pluck the little griffin up and knock him out just to get some peace and quiet. Can, can we just go forward? I really don't want to fly, but we are wasting time not doing anything. Her voice was nearly a squeak at first, but the more she put it in to it, the more she felt relieved as she was getting her mind off of her heat and onto anything else. And to her surprise, Crow squinted at her, still fuming, but he grumbled and turned, walking slowly as Oso looked over at her and smiled but didn't speak. The trip was quite relatively quiet. The only excitement was in the form of a few raiders who spotted them but ran for the hills when Oso uprooted a boulder and hurled it with quite some impressive range. At least the big griffin would spare her from the terrors of the raiders. The sun sagged in the sky behind the impenetrable clouds. Lexi's head was still aching and her joints were stiff, but this was about the time that they started looking for an easily defendable spot to hunker down for the night. But to her confusion, she saw no hints of Oso slowing down. Even Crow seemed a little concerned. But altogether, they continued until finally Oso stopped and cleared his throat. Aye. You see that down there? He gestured to a small thicket of bushes. Yeah? Crow scoffed. What, are we hiding the bushes for the night? Oso chuckled. Well, I don't blame you for not noticing. It has a pretty strong enchantment on it. He smirked, and Lexi looked over at it, but for some odd reason she felt like she couldn't be bothered. Staring at the bushes was not only boring, but noticeably annoying. She looked over at Oso, and he smiled a little brighter. Look around. No other living bushes for miles. Just go through and wait for me. Wait for you? What are you doing? Crow seemed a bit unsure, but he inched closer to Lexicon. I have something I normally do in this place. He gestured for them to continue, and didn't seem like he was going to move until they left. This played on Lexicon's nerves, but she did trust Oso more than she trusted most people. Even Kroos had shown that he trusted very slightly less than the big griffin. Looking back, she nodded and started forward. Kroos grumbled and followed. Pushing into the bushes, she noticed very little other than that it seemed a tremendous waste of time. The feelings running through her made complete sense. Despite the fact that it was the only living plant for miles, she never would have noticed it if Oso hadn't pointed it out. And even going through it flooded her with emotions and opinions that it was a bad idea or a waste of time. Truly, this was a perfect way to hide something. Quite literally, no pony, but those who knew how to find it would get into it. They continued along, making few observations. There was another entryway, just a little ways off, and one up in the ceiling. She could even feel the magical repelling emotions as she stared at the other entrances. The arena itself was something like a dimly lit cavern made from what looked like a collapsed bridge, a crashed airship, the crumbling ruins of a building, and a cliffside. Even stranger, she saw absolutely no sign of such things on the outside. At least she didn't remember such. Maybe there's magic hiding the outside, too. Lexi's gentle strides continued with Kroos at her side. She didn't slow down until she spotted what she figured they were looking for. But she was still had no idea what she was looking at. There was an old oak tree beside a wide circular clearing of cobblestone arranged in an oddly symmetrical design. Is this where we're going to camp? She looked at Kroos, who shrugged, but her next step sent her sprawling with a yelp. It took her a moment to realize it, but she had tripped over something living. Kroos quickly drew his pistol and slowed a bit 
as a gray one-eyed griffin stood up and mumbled. It leaned to the side, looked at her, and she nearly had to cover her nose at the extreme stench of vodka. Looking up, the drunk griffin, a little closer, she could see the lines under his eyes. He was old, not ancient, but easily in his, his mid to late fifties. And as her eyes dropped low on the clink of bottles, she spotted at least four bottles of vodka. She was able to tell two things right away. If her memory was correct, this was Oso's companion Tyron, and he was completely and utterly drunk off his ass. Um, hello? She nervously spoke, but froze when his talons came up and seized her head with a mild grasp. He tilted her back and forth before turning her around. Her face lit up bright red as he lifted her tail, and just under a second, he shook his head and grumbled. Nah, pass! Tyron let go, rolling back and forth, and went to fumbling with another bottle. Lexi fumed, blushing so bright that she almost didn't notice Kroos rolling over laughing. It's official, mud pony. You're unfuckable. Kroos nearly choked as he rolled about. Lexicon nearly snapped at him, but she was still in shock, as well as her injuries. She wanted a place to hide until Oso came back, and it didn't help that the Lexies inside were crying and frothing at the mouth in utter livid rage. Hope sparked to life in her as she noticed Oso striding in. He seemed like he was in a bit of a hurry, but oddly his weapons were stuffed into his bag, even popping out of them, instead of under his wings. Though she grimaced at the reason he was hurrying, she could plainly hear movement and shouting outside. Aye, everyone into the... Tyron, what the hell are you doing? Also paused in front of the drunk griffin. Tyron stood and blinked, squitting at Oso before grumbling and clearing his throat. Arl kicked me out of the castle, said if I want to get schwitchfaced, that I had to do it somewhere else. Oso groaned, and finally the voices outside made their way in. A small group of pegasi fluttered down into the clearing and from the hole above. At their lead was a pegasus dressed in a very fine slender suit of power armor. The two on her sides had something akin to half a power armor suit on with heavy energy weapons attached to battle saddles, and two more had mounted laser rifles mounted on the battle saddles. Lexi had to guess that this was the enclave Oso had been speaking and warning about. The power armored mare at the lead looked extremely impatient and levied her gaze directly at Oso. Despite all of his talk and how little a threat the enclave was and why they shouldn't be afraid to fly everywhere, Crow seemed a touch worried. Taking out his Susie rifle and popping around in it as he seemed to step back and orbit a near viable cover, Lexi took a second to wonder how they'd gotten in, but it was logical to assume that if any pony saw someone go into the entrance, it would be easy enough to uh, gain the power through the wards. One look at the lead pony, and she easily guessed that the mare had more than the needed amount of mental stimulation to follow Oso. She looked very angry. And now we've finally caught you. To think we've been so damned elusive this whole time. This was pretty damned easy. Lexicon only vaguely could read the insignia on the mare's armor. If she was reading it collectively, and if they used the same or similar ranking insignias from before the war, the Enclave Mare was a Lieutenant Colonel. But the way she walked and the way the soldiers followed her showed a great deal of confidence, but at the same time uncertainty among her troops. Either she was known for doing unsavory things, or she was somewhat nude on the job, and the others hadn't quite taken a trusting into her yet. She had seen such things when her division got a new chief of security. The guards would follow orders to the letter, but always had a little unsureness to them, as if trying to test the water to see what kind of leader they had. However, the mayor's words grabbed everyone's attention, even the drunk tyrant. But, by the way, Oso had come in and his constant fuss over the enclave, she felt safe assuming he was at fault somehow. Pissing off the feeble-minded army upstairs, Oso. Tyron chuckled, before standing up straight. You can have these two. 
I don't know who the fuck they are or whatever, but I need the big guy. The lieutenant colonel did look, not look a little amused. But to Lexi's surprise, Lieutenant Colonel Zanger, it was Osa who got out the next word. Actually, Tyron, we need them. Bullshit, I'm not in the mood for it. He picked up a bottle and shook it before smiling at the life-splashing noise. No, we need them. We have the Susie's help, but they'll help only if she's on the project, and he is her bodyguard. He raised a set of talons as if trying to calm them down. Tyron seemed to think for a moment, for grumbling, clearly annoyed and even personally insulted that he had to deal with Lexi and Kroos. Fine. But if I get pissed off, I'm killing the bodyguard. He shot a glance at Kroos, and Kroos seemed at a loss for what to do. With his bravado, Lexi swore he would have talked back, but he seemed to just sink back a little. Tyron squinted his one eye and stood upright. Right, so we're keeping them. You guys can go fuck off or whatever. He stumbled about, swaying from side to side before bringing the bottle to his beak, and with a complete lack of grace, he knocked it back, draining what little he could down his throat. But in that act that made Lexi jump, the impatient lieutenant colonel fired a bolt of energy through the bottle, shattering it. Lexi was a touch surprised at the lack of speedy reaction from Tyron, she would think that he would at least flinch, but all he did was turn ever so slightly and glare at the fuming lieutenant colonel. It was about this time that Lexi took notice of something else. The others at her side seemed very nervous, and she got the reason why when one of the lieutenant colonel's men spoke up. Ma'am, this griffin matches the description of known locations of level 5 threats. In fact, <clears throat> he swallowed. Sweat beating up upon his brow as he sputtered out more. In fact, I happen to know for certain that this is that exact griffin. We need to just let him be. The mare glared daggers at him and turned about, fuming as she growled out her next words. You're uh, mistaken, and I don't care. We have power armor and five soldiers. He's a drunk. His stench is likely more dangerous as that anything else about him. He could probably smell the vodka all the way back at Thunderhead. The soldiers fumed at her words. He'll kill you fast. He'll kill us all. He seemed almost delusional with fear. This made Lexi stare at the drunk griffin with a great deal of confusion. He was still struggling to stand upright. Not exactly the image of something that earned much fear. Tyron grinned and dipped low as he swayed on his paws and talons. Ah, oh, little feathered buddy. If I wanted to kill some pony... You would have done it already. How cliché can you get? Screw it all. Arrest them all and ready them for transport. The unamused lieutenant colonel glared as she went silent when she blinked at Tyron, who was already in front of her, as if he had teleported without a flash. He was simply there his talons gently caressing her visor, but simultaneously gouging deep gashes into the protective metal. Oh, my little pony. You need to let grown-ups finish when they speak. I mean, I might be a little cliché, but that doesn't mean that I don't like to have me fun. He smiled, pressing his forehead against the visor, closing his eye as he muttered. Now, if I wanted to hurt some pony, there's literally nothing within your capability that could keep me from doing so. His eyes snapped open, and instantly an odd glowing black tar began to drip out of its socket. The mare threw herself back and unloaded her energy weapons at him, but he vanished, trailing like darkness through smoky ink through water. He plowed through the soldiers, the two lightly armored ones simply tumbled, screaming in pain with hyperextended legs or a fractured jaw, but the two armored personnel escorts to the lieutenant colonel fell to the ground, gasping wounds in their necks and heads, their bodies twitching and spasming, their armor cracked like the shell of a walnut. The lieutenant colonel spun around, un unable to lock onto Tyron, levied her aim at Oso, who actually looked like he was caught in a panic. 
but even with a slew of power-armored guns trained at him, he didn't take the air. He just bolted for cover, but it was unneeded as Tyron plowed into the mare and his talons, trailing sickly black ink, latched onto her visor and tore away the armor like it was cardboard, exposing the left side of her face and neck. Oi, if you're going to be an obnoxious cunt, and you do want to be a good girl, I'll let you leave with just a flesh wound. He grinned, but she squinted in confusion at his remark, and she tried to struggle and squirm free from his oddly powerful grip. Other than being a little battered and her armor decimated, she was relatively untouched. Until Tyron's talons rested on her neck and began to apply pressure, dragging into the flesh. The mare broke into a scream as Tyron pulled back his grip, tearing off a bloody chunk of her body. Lexi staggered back with wide eyes before she doubled over and vomited. Even Kroos looked put off, but the younger griffin didn't vomit. Not until Tyron dropped the bloody chunk of meat into his open beak and swallowed it with a happy sigh. Nice and sweet. Now, you're ready to fuck off, or do I have to rip off more bloody parts? I bet that eye would pop out easy. Blue eyes do taste the best, after all. Tyron reached over to her exposed face, but stepped off to her, allowing her to do a severely panicked fumbling dash to the exit, desperately holding on to the hole in her neck, currently gushing blood. The other enclave soldiers followed in an equal panic, flying as fast as they could and as fast as their legs, and had a rather few serious injuries. Lexi simply stared, speechless, mouth agape, and in disbelief. The only thing that snapped her out of it was Ostho slowly walking up and patting Tyron on the back. They're gone now. Tyron all at once went limp and fell to the ground like a grumbling pile. I drag me to the nearest bottle. No. Ostho grabbed the old griffin's tail and dragged him to the cobblestone circle before gesturing for Lexi and Kroos to follow. They'll be back soon and they'll be looking for their dead comrades. They'll find you before your power returns. Lexi raised a hoof with a still confused look on her face. Oso raised a single talon to her and grumbled, Not right now, I'll explain it later. Lexi slowly lowered her hoof and Oso leaned in as if speaking to the cobblestone as he spoke loud and clear, Yin, six. Lexi waited patiently, but squirmed, nearly dancing like she needed to pee. The whole scenario left her with endless questions she needed to ask. Curious Lexi was practically having an aneurysm, but all that curiosity went to dread as the ground beneath her hooves began to give way. A harsh green glow exploded outward and everything on the cobblestone was sucked down. The hungry earth sucked them in, and her vision filled with blinding green light. But oddly, it smelled like a vast forest untouched by industry or even primitive hooves. There was an eerie primal fear, and oddly a comfort as well. Then a cold shock of an endless darkness grabbed at her. Footnote. Level 5 achieved. Perk added. Character analysis. You're getting better at reading faces and sensing motives. Unlocks unique dialogue options and gives you a bonus when trying to convince or bluff.